Star Drive 117.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind Hey guys, how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8 It is Thursday, June 1st And welcome to today's Alpha Day podcast So happy for you joining us And we are ready to start another day together with the Lord So, subscribe to us on YouTube Follow us on SoundCloud And make sure to subscribe Support us on Patreon. So what do we have today on this exciting podcast for you? We have sermons in the sky, Q&A Thursday, and of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world in this history today. All right, everyone, how are you doing and how was your Wednesday a service last night? Also, hope you guys really enjoyed it, receive a lot of fire and grace. But of course, as we say each and every week, make sure to give encouragement and good feedback to your uh, leaders and make sure, you know, our goal is to make it so that everyone is receiving grace and fire and power from that message. So make sure you keep praying for your leaders too. Uh, if you haven't yet, go ahead, leave a like or a comment to build this community. Really happy for everyone joining us here every weekday and on the weekends so let's get up and support each other uh each and every day all right so it is thursday and yes we are on the downhill of the week as we have two days left before the weekend and yes it is alpha day it is the day that history began. We commemorate this day, and I hope it's something that uh, as we are listening to the stories once again, uh, it'll reignite our hearts of how this began and how this, you know, how amazing it is for us to be in this position. I think this is something that we have to really get into our heads is it started like 45, 40, yeah, 45 years ago. 45 years of this history, but think about it. 45 years is not long when you think about like a uh, history, like say Christianity started. If you look at year 45, what was going on during that time? But here we are 45 years later. And this is something that I bet you that even Sunstein couldn't imagine it would be like this right now. I don't think Sunstein could even imagine this, right? It's a time to kind of reset and restart the year. It's a great um, trigger for our minds psychologically to say, you know what? Time to start anew. Try to time to, to start something new. And, you know, it, it's really interesting, especially this year in 2023, that we are celebrating the beginning of history in the the last prophecy of the Bible of 2023. Right, so that that's kind. Of, it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of cool that we're in this situation. So, uh, I am very, very excited, and I hope that all of you guys are going to enjoy this Alpha Day, just giving thanks to, um, giving thanks to the Holy Trinity, to Jesus, to the Man of Mission, because uh, it is such an important time for all of us to commemorate and never forget. Oh, I, uh, you know what? Okay, well, here's one thing that I, uh, I was thinking about when it came to um, Alpha Day. Now, there's a couple things in my mind. So, the first one that's very, very interesting is. Um, I was thinking in my head, you know, especially when, you know, we talk about Sunstein going to uh, Mount Pebang or Pebang Mountain, right? So for one week, he was praying in the mountains before he went uh, into Seoul to begin history, right? So the one thing that came to my mind is like, why would he have to do that? Like a week before starting his mission, uh, why would he have to set another condition when he just spent 20 years in the mountains being trained? Like, isn't that in itself a powerful and great condition. Isn't that enough, right? To be in those harsh training, praying and, you know, going through the snows and the winters. And then right before he starts, it's like, I want you to do another prayer condition. And then you're in a field with poisonous snakes. And it's like, do you, like, why would this next condition have to be done when he's already spent 20 years doing this? And I was thinking about this, like, oh, well, what would be the reason? And, uh, when I was thinking about this week's Sunday message, you know, it was, you know, the one big thing that God said was, is do not change, do not change, do not change. And I was, I realized, you know, this is about not changing, right? If, you know, think about this. If we relied solely on the past times of what you did in the past, then like, think about, you know, think about it right now is how could at this time in history right now, how could all these people who did so many amazing things in the past just leave? You know what I mean? Where our faith isn't just about what we did before. Uh, it's about what we're doing right now and knowing what we're going to face in the future, right? And that condition was like, you know, think about it. He had to, since he had no idea what was going to happen when he went, uh, went to Seoul. 
He had no idea that no one would be waiting for him. He had no idea that he wouldn't find a single person to, to come to this history and for like two years and 10 months. He had no idea. He had no idea that going and starting his mission meant he would have to go to another city, but still live in the mountains in that suffering and pain again. He had no idea, right? And this condition was like kind of that final stamp and if you kind of think about it, it's kind of like that final stamp before Jesus started his mission. He was in, you know, fasting and praying for 40 days uh, in, the, you know, 40 days in the desert, right? It's kind of that final stamp before he goes out to, to get him ready and solid. That condition is set so that he's not going to change, right? And, you know, I, I realized like, yeah, you know what? You know, even for us too, we could have done so many good things in the past. But what about right now? Are you ready for right now? And this is why we continue to set conditions. We continue to be on this 70-day uh, repentance condition, right? Faith is not based on just what we did in the past. It's about where we are now and knowing what we're about to face, right? So when I was thinking about that, I was like, oh, you know, that, that makes a lot more sense now when I look at this week's message, right? It's not, it's not a, you know, it's about not changing. It's that setting that condition before you go out into that big place and like, are you really ready for this? Because people could change when they go through really difficult times. And, um, you know, right before us, you know, I think we have to think about us too. Before we get into these crazy situations, we need to pray to be strong. The past is the past, right? But what about right now? And we have to make sure that we don't change also. So, and, and it kind of, my thoughts kind of extended even more that all of us here today, I think we have a better idea of understanding the shimjong of the disciples at the time of Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Like, what part? Uh, I think we can really understand what they felt uh, when we think about what happened in March, right? And maybe realize more deeply about what the disciples felt about, like, let's just say, one of their own turning, like Judas Iscariot, one of the 12. There wasn't many of them. And when they found out that what Judas did... Like a lot of times we don't think about what the disciples were thinking or what their hearts were going through. We just never thought about it. But when you think about what we went through even right now, it's like, oh my goodness, like this is what they were feeling. Like we don't get to see the insights of, um, we don't see the insights of what the hearts of the disciples were like when they found out about Judas, right? Like we have no idea because it's more based on the story of Jesus, but if we had memoirs, you know, which would be kind of crazy, like if we had memoirs of the 12, of the, the 11 disciples, um, you know, that, you know, the, the other 11 disciples, I, I thought to myself, man, this is how they really felt, like how shook they were at that time. And uh, I was just like, yeah, that's, that's something that I think that we have to, that we have to realize, understand that we're going through a very similar parallel thing. And we have to be those that really uh, are thinking about, man, the disciples went through something just as crazy as we did. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's something that we should be thinking about also. Either way. Oh, I have some great news. So I told you guys that I, I, I started this uh, coloring books for kids using AI and stuff like that too, right? And um, so uh, there's a friend of mine, right? The friend of mine, uh, they're like, um, uh, they said to me like, hey, when you sell your first book, um, let's go out and celebrate. So like, I think, I think they meant going out to celebrate means they're going to take me out to eat or something like that. Right. You know, just as the first, Oh yeah, you sold your first book kind of thing. So, um, uh, when they said that to me, I was like, Oh, cool. So then it's only been like two days since I've released it. Right. And then I checked, I checked my sales and I had my first sale already. So I was like, Whoa, I'm so thankful to God. Right. And cause the only way I would have checked it is if um, is because that person said, you know, that we're going to celebrate, right? And I was like, oh my gosh. And then I checked it. And within two days, I've already got one sale. I'm not, I haven't checked it lately, but I've got one sale already. And they bought the, the coloring book on dragons. So it, that was kind of cool. So I am super grateful, thankful to God. My first sale on my coloring book has already happened. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of like what the platform is. The platform at Amazon, you have hundreds of millions of people that are all, uh, um, that are all looking for certain things. And since they found it, I am thankful and I am grateful either way, right? So uh, that's that's some good news for me. Like if you guys are in Japan, uh, North America or Europe or Australia, uh, that's where they're being, so and Brazil, right? So Europe, 
uh, North America, Japan, Australia, or Brazil. Uh, just search like uh, the greatest coloring book ever, and you're gonna find all those things, all, all those coloring books there. And I, I'm st I'm just constantly making because I have 30 days to for my account to close, and I'm gonna do as much as I can, as many books as I can until it's done, kind of thing, until that uh, account is done for the full month. So we're just gonna see what's gonna happen there. Either way, so I'm super happy about that. Oh, uh, pre-dawn message today was was kind of, oh, uh, there's one part of the pre-dawn message that I was listening to that really made me think about my past too. And uh, he was, this uh, the pastor was talking about his finances, right? Remember he's talking about um, being affected because, you know, his sister gave him like $25,000, you know, to find a new place and stuff like that too. And he he said something very interesting. He says, if you're really affected by money, it's better to, not have that much money and be strong in faith. And, and I totally agree with that. It's kind of that self-awareness that we need. And it reminded me of the time when I was a lot younger. I think I was like 27 or 28, uh, you know, like 10, 15 years ago. And, you know, I'm obviously not as mature or experienced as I am now. And at that time, I was touring Korea and Japan, giving like these talks and stuff like that. And I received, you know, after those two tours, I did two tours of uh, Korea, one of Japan, and... At the end of it, my bank account had like $7,000, like the most amount of money I've ever had, like at that point in my life. Because, you know, I've been running full-time profit. I've never had that much money. I was like, oh my gosh. And it was, I was so, like for me, I was so nervous about that money because it was so much money for me at that time. And uh, after that was done, I was getting ready to uh, leave for another tour of the world, like going back to those countries that I was helping pioneer and such. And then at that point, I thought to myself is, you know, like one of the things that uh, that really allowed me to rely on God during those times I was pioneering and helping out other countries was that, you know, I had nothing else to rely. I had no money. I had nothing else, but I only had to rely on God, right? And I was like, man, I took those, my first two trips I took, uh, you know, I really, really just relied on God. And then I realized that having this like $7,000 in my bank account uh, it made me feel more safe. And I was thinking, I, I was kind of like, just at that moment, I was self-aware. I was like, you know what? If this stops me from relying on God, I, I can't keep this, right? Or else I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make even more mistakes. And uh, what I did was I just took all the money. I took it all out of the account and I just donated it all to Wormundo. And then I set out again on another trip. And, you know, of course, you know, that was like 10, 15 years ago, which is, you know, but now, you know, of course, now I am more mature and, you know, I, I'm able to, I have much more experience. But at that time, I knew it was better not to have that, that money for myself. And that's what that story in the, in the pre-dawn was reminding me about also. So I, I found that to be quite, uh, it, it gave me a, a nice reflection point. Like, yeah, that's so true. Because in my life, it was very, very similar whether I'm relying on God or relying on this money or myself. So, yeah. Oh, you know, um, have you guys ever had this experience before? Uh, so, you know, I, I have, I'm doing sermons in the sky today. But last night, I'm um, going to bed. It's like, uh, it's like 11 p.m., 11 something. And uh, I was already lying in bed. Lights are off and everything else. And then, boom, inspiration came for me uh, for the sermons in the sky. And I sat there kind of contemplating to myself. I was like, oh, should I write it down or should I do it in the morning? But then in my head, I'm like, but so many times I get inspiration and then I do nothing and wait for later. And then I forget, I forget, I forget that inspiration. And then I spent like the next amount of time just wasting it, trying to remember, oh, what was that great point that I thought about the other day or the, or in the morning or whatever it was. And, you know, and you're kind of sitting there wishing that you wrote it down right away. So, you know, I sat there contemplating and then I, you know, I was like, all right, I just got to get up. So, you know, I, I fumbled around in the dark, found my notebook, uh, my laptop and started writing the stuff down. And then I finished writing it down and then I closed the laptop and then I went back, you know, I put it back on the table. Then I got back in bed still in the, I did all this in the dark. And then, well, while I lay my head down again, it's like, Boom, another inspiration comes like, oh, that's so true. Should I wait? Or, ah, so I had to get back out of bed. And this happened four times. 
right? And, you know, I got four times. Every time I lay my head down, there's kind of like this new inspiration, like kept going more and more. And, you know, I'm kind of like in my head, I was just like, yeah, you know, sometimes we just got, sometimes it doesn't matter the situation, circumstance, you just got to go and do it, right? Once it comes, you just got to do it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, what Sunseep says in the past is, you know, the one who gets the inspiration is the one that should do it. Right, the moment you should get it, just go ahead and do it, or else you may lose that inspiration, or or the Holy Spirit's trying to lead you to a certain place, and like that's like I was like, yeah, you know, I just, I just got to write it down. Like you know, it's it's only gonna take. It took me about what thirty minutes to just start writing some stuff down, and altogether of the four times that I got up, but uh, it gave me some great things to think about uh, for today's sermon in the sky. So I was really thankful about this. Oh, last thing I want to talk about today is uh, uh, there's a comment that came out from Louisa. Right. And it's it's kind of a response to the man cave. And I, I really, really like the response because it's talking about everyone, you know, when it's talking about, you know, people treating each other in a cold way, like treating the opposite sex in a cold way, or or you know, like you know, driving in a car, are they is you know, is it okay to drive someone one on one? You know, you know, these types of things come up all the time. And the point that was made by Luisa, which is really good, is like everyone has different boundaries. Everyone does. And I totally agree with that. That's something I totally agree with. And I also agree that, you know, um, and, and also the next thing I agree with is about how we treat each other, right? So say we have, bound, we all have boundaries, right? And I understand that too, right? People are going to have boundaries. They're going to have their, they have their own experiences in life and it affects how we treat each other, okay? But there's one thing I, I definitely think is very, very important is that like in church, right, is that people should never treat each other in a cold way. I think that's an, that's like, it's very rare that should happen, unless, of course, they really deserve it. Meaning, uh, let's just say someone of the opposite sex is constantly making advances towards you, right? And you've constantly rejected them. Then, of course, at that time, I would understand like, yo, you, like, I would even say you got to treat them cold, just ignore them kind of thing, right? But in the general setting, I, I, I don't think people should ever be treating other people in a cold way. Like in church, like in a church setting, just greeting is okay. Like greeting is like, if, if people have a problem with greeting others, I think that is more of a personal issue and something that's probably like deep trauma or you've learned it the wrong way, right? I, 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 I don't think people should ever be treating each other coldly in a church setting, like when they greet each other. I think people can be warm in greeting each other, right? But of course, people's boundaries... Uh, in what they do next is different. Yeah, I'm going to be very warm to everyone, girl or guy, warm with the greed. Oh, they, oh, so glad you came, this, this, and this. Yeah, because, uh, you know, you really want people to feel welcomed at the church, right? And that's just the greeting part. Of course, I do think boundaries are there where some people will not chat to anyone right after. And that's fine. Some people like won't go to an event because there's guys and girls together. That's fine. Like a board game event, whatever it is, board game night. And some people, you know, may not just might be super introverts that may not be comfortable with doing anything, even with the same sex kind of thing, right? So, you know, the reason I'm saying this is the the church has to be a warm place. It's a place where people can feel God's love through you, right? Which means that people will come to church, feel the warmth. They'll feel that there's, these are really high quality people in the church. Everyone is so nice and warm. and But I'm talking mainly only about greetings at least, right? You know, and, and when, you know, when it's time to reject, not reject, but, you know, people can be very nice with rejecting in, invites. You know, if it's something beyond their boundaries, which everyone's going to have their own, I, I think people can be very nice with that. Right? And let's just say there's a board game night, both guys and girls, and that person is uncomfortable with that. Like the good way is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not into board games. Or, oh, I, ha I already have plans. Da, 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 da. You know, you could just say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very polite way. The bad way that I've seen sometimes is, I can't believe you guys are mixing. Oh, you guys are bad. Oh, that, isn't, that, is, isn't that dangerous? Like, I think that's a bad way of doing it. And I would say that if you really had a problem, go talk in private to the person running the event right? Like for me, I really don't get other stuff is like when people go, like say someone's in charge of the event, then they go to the person in charge of the event. Like instead of going right to the person in charge of the event, they go straight to the head leader. They go straight to HQ or I'm the, like for me, that's like, oh, that's just ridiculous, right? That, that means this person doesn't have, uh, 
the the experience or like the maturity just to talk to the person to get to understand what's happening kind of thing right so i i think it's something that people have to do things in a very mature way and if anything else i'd say be mature be mature about it but when it comes to church church is a place that people should feel the warmth of god you're not trying to exude your kindness to people it's kind of like what Louisa said. It is treating people how the Trinity would treat them. I think that's the best way to think about it. Do you think the Trinity would ever treat someone in a cold way? Like I said, besides, besides the times when people are making, like this person, this opposite sex person is giving you like advances and trying to talk to you more, calling you privately and you keep rejecting them. I understand that. But in general situations, I think people just need to be mature about it. Yeah, we, the church should be a very warm place. And it's just a greeting. Oh, how are you? And it's small talk. Small talk is no big deal, right? And for, for you know, for some people who have their boundaries, yeah, you, you know your boundaries, be polite about it, and just move forward with it, right? And people are not going to be like, whoa, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? You know what I mean? And you just don't want it to be in a situation where people are feeling like, like, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard this saying. This is an old saying from my generation is who peed in your cereal? You know, who peed in your cereal that you're acting like this kind of thing, right? I'm not sure what you guys would say uh, would say in this generation, but that's what we would say if someone is just being really rude or cold when there's no need to be at that time kind of thing. Either way. Either way. Actually, there is one more thing that uh, I, kind, I find kind of funny. Because <laughs> I talked about the other day about getting, um, you know, someone telling me that, oh, on your Instagram, you know, if you follow and like or respond to other people's stories or Instagram, people might think that you're interested in them. And I first want to reiterate myself is I think each country and culture is different and I'm not going to tell each country and culture how to do it. Right? I mean, we got to respect each other's cult- countries and cultures. Like, it's almost like one country shouldn't be telling another country how to run their country. Like, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Right? However, uh, if you are in a place, right, if you are in, um, say, a country or a culture where it's frowned upon, right, uh, like, like I, I think you can do two things. And I think one of them is, you know, why are you even making an IG account in the first place? If you're going to freak out about the opposite sex contacting you, if you're going to freak out about people like not contacting, but like liking your stuff and uh, writing stuff on it, then why well, you shouldn't even make an IG account in the first place. It's a public platform for anyone, both guys and girls, right? Just the fact you're posting on a public platform makes no sense that you would complain or talk about someone of the opposite, opposite sex responding. You know, you know what I mean? It's a public platform, you know, big deal, right? Then, or, you know, of course, people can make it private. Make your IG private, right? And only choose the people you want, right? But but I think it's kind of weird if you have a private account. Then you accept someone of the opposite gender into your private account. And then you get shocked that they respond to your IG stories and posts. For me, that's like entrapment. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what it feels like it's like that doesn't it doesn't really make any sense like if you don't want any of those things number one is don't even make an uh, instagram account don't even make it secondly make it private if you're gonna make it make it private and only choose girls but don't have a private instagram and then accept an someone of the opposite sex into your private instagram and then be shocked that they respond to uh, that they're like liking and putting up emojis on your Instagram stories and stuff like that. Because I, I think that's the, that's the easiest way to do it. It really is. It's so simple. Like, you, you, it's it's kind of like, a, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it's kind of like, I'm not sure, the, I'm not going to say arrogance the right word, because that's not the right word. I'm not trying to be like in that negative sense, but it kind of feels like, well, this is a public platform, but it can only go according to the way I want it. And that's kind of like, no, that doesn't make any sense, right? No, you got to understand it's like, if you're in the public platform in the world, right? It's a world platform. You're going to have many people that are responding and doing things according to their own culture, Right? So, you know, when we see a response or we see something else coming from someone else, you got to understand, oh, is this com- which culture is this coming from, right? Because um, in some other countries, like for me is, I don't have any problems with me responding or uh, liking or putting emojis on 
people in the Western country, zero. No one's like, Pastor Sky, um, so I see that you're like totally uh, responding and liking to my things and I feel really uncomfortable and I'm a little bit triggered by uh, these responses, right? Like, I don't get that. It's like, you know, it's just like, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever it is, ha ha ha, they respond to mine, ha ha ha, right? It, it's just, that's the point of putting up the IG stories and stuff because, you know, you want people to see it and you want them to respond, Like, technically speaking, social media is about getting responses, right? If it wasn't about responses or anything else, you wouldn't even post it on Instagram. Either way, I'm not going to go any more longer on this. I will not. Either way, okay? So, um... Yeah. So those are a couple of things that I've been thinking about, and I hope it's something that you guys are also thinking about too. But, uh, yeah. Uh, let's get into our first break for today. Okay, so uh, let's get into today's second segment. And of course, every single uh, Thursday, we have Q&A Thursday and we have questions from the audience and such. And uh, a couple of really, really good questions that I wanted to uh, talk about. I had two, two questions. Uh, one is from uh, Instagram uh, DM and the other one, I believe, is from Patreon. I think I think those are the two it's coming from, right? So let's go to the first question today. Um, and the first question is kind of talking about what's happening lately. And the question is, how do such good people in faith leave or be shaken so much at this time? Like these were people that were really good in faith. And uh, it, it is a good question because I think a lot of people are shocked. Like we're genuinely shocked by the people um, who have just gotten up and left and changed their hearts. And it's like, wow, how did that happen? These people were so good in faith, right? So these people that are good in faith, how do we know that we're, how do we know that they're good in faith? And we base it on what, 
what we saw them do, right? Their actual actions, which were really good, lecturing, preaching, taking care of a lot of people and, and, you know, and, and just doing a lot of good things in this history. And we base, our, oh, this person has good faith could look at their actions, which makes sense, right? It's kind of like um, when you read the scriptures like Matthew 7, 15 to 20, it talks about you could tell a tree by its fruit. And when you look at the fruits of these people, you look at them and say, oh, wow, these people are really good people, right? And that's how we base it. However, there are some things that we really need to understand that sometimes people's actions are not always true. Now, what does that mean? True doesn't mean that they're false. Like If they're not true, it doesn't mean that they're false. It doesn't mean it's bad. What does it mean that sometimes people's actions are not always true? And there's two things, right? Like two things that we have to consider when, why, when and why people take action. For instance, uh, there is a motive, right? What is the motive of them taking action, right? So, you know, uh, I talked about this last week and I said that Usually when in extreme difficulties, it illuminates people's motives, why they're really doing it. And sometimes when I say that people's uh, actions may not be true, it just means that their motive is different than what we thought it was, right? So let me give you an example. When I was a head leader, I would never, ever miss a pre right? Right? And that's the power given me to by God. And of course, that's the responsibility I have as being a leader. Right. But once I step down, uh, it's really only about you and yourself. And you begin to realize is, oh, you know, part of my motive of just never missing pre is because I was the leader. Like that was one of the motives. I have to look good. Right. And when you get to the extreme difficulties, you realize some of your motives may not have been the best motive or it might not have been true motives. Right. So when we look at people's actions, yeah, sometimes the motive is not what we thought or the motive changed, right? Some, some people do it because they love God. Some people do it because they're self-conscious. They don't want people to look down on them. Some people are doing it because if they don't do it, then they're not going to get paid monthly. Like there's a bunch of, like some people do it for status. I don't know what it is. Everyone has different motives and we don't really know the motive. We don't until really, really hard times set in if their motives have changed or anything else. So motive plays a big role in understanding that people's actions may not always be true. The second thing is we just don't have enough knowledge of these people, right? We just, we honestly, we really don't know about people. We'll only see probably about 10 to 15% of their lives because when do we see them? We don't see them at work. We don't see them when they're at home alone. We don't see all the other different things. So we really don't have a lot of knowledge about people just to say that, um, oh, their actions are good, which means that they're good. And I'm going to say that probably generally speaking, that is, you know, it's, it's, that's, it's true generally. But sometimes some people like we don't have enough knowledge. We don't know what this, what's going on in their hearts. Um, we don't know about their past. Some people have past traumas. We don't know about the present, what, what they're doing today. Like if I were to talk about what, what um, a present, like the present knowledge of the present means, do you really know how they're doing today? Yesterday, they may have been good, but today they may not be good, right? So like three, four years ago, pre-pandemic, a lot of people were really good. But if you look at the present, a lot of people are still affected in their faith by the pandemic. It's just normal. I, I was affected by a lot too. Yeah, we're just affected by it. And if we understand this too, is basically showing that, hey, people's actions may not always be tr like be the, the best indicator because number one, we don't know their motive. And number two, we don't really know about these people and what they're doing or going on in their life, right? Which, which kind of made me think a lot more deeply too about, can you imagine what God sees? Like God sees our motives. He sees our heart. And that must be really tough for God to look at because he, he'll literally see the direction you are heading which for me would be quite scary. Like, oh my gosh, like God can look at someone and say, man, this person's getting ready to leave. If this person continues in this way, they're not going to be good in their faith. And for me, I was just like, wow, that, that's got to be tough for God knowing and seeing people's hearts and their motives. And, and, and then again, of course, it, it would be quite exciting to be God too, that if God sees someone on that path and all of a sudden they change and they come back and they're even stronger, like that's got to make God so happy. Like some people might think, oh, it's all predestined. So why would God be so happy? Well, you know, then why would there be so much celebration for a life coming back if it was predestined, right? Remember, predestination is only for what is good, right? So on a personal note, uh, 
I think one of the big things that people need to do when it comes to faith is you need to set hard lines in some areas of your life. Like your faith, right? The foundation of your faith, you got to set some lines. Like lines you would never cross. Like an example, I've told you guys this before. I was, you know, born in the Christian church. And when I was like 15 years old, I was more into popularity, sports and stuff like this, and girls, whatever it was. And I backslid and I stopped going to church altogether. However, I would never deny Jesus. Never. I would never say there is no God. It wasn't even a thought to stop believing in God and Jesus. Even though I stopped going to church, I would still believe in God. I still believe in Jesus, no matter what. I had my lines that were so hardwired into my head, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't cross those lines. And even for me now in Providence, like that's a line that I would never cross. I would never deny God. I would never reject Jesus. Never. Right? And here now, even today in this history, same thing. No matter how hard or bad or, or how bad I slide in my faith, there's some lines I will never cross. I just can't. It's just so hardwired into me, right? So like denying God and Jesus, I, I could I couldn't do that. Right. Some other things probably like like the fall is very hardwired. I, I I don't it's just it's too hardwired in me that I couldn't like oh, what that's too far kind of thing, right? So I, I do think that's something that people have to get, you know, start like making those lines for themselves, right? And if you do hardwire them in, you just never cross them. Right? You never cross it's so hard. And if you do, it would take a marathon and, and a lot of struggle just to cross those lines. So, yeah, I, I think this is kind of like the things that we need to think about is why do people of such good faith leave? And the answer is we really don't know about their lives, like knowledge. We don't know about what they're going through. We don't know how much they were really affected, right? And then, of course, motives. Like I said, extreme difficulties illuminate people's motives. And sometimes we don't, you know, we may think that they are doing all these actions because of this motive. Which, you know, in a time where it's not so difficult, it makes no difference. They're just doing such good work and we're so happy and they're so great that they're doing all these amazing things that we kind of just take it for granted and say, oh, they, have, they, they love God so much and this is all for God or, you know, that's their motive. But, you know, you're not going to see it until we hit these really extreme times that, oh, maybe their motives was not what we thought, right? So when, I, when we look at people's actions, uh, I'm not saying the actions are bad. But some, we just don't know motives. We don't know the real motive. And we just don't know how much they, what, what they're really going through, what their life is really like, right? And that's why uh, it's hard. It's, we shouldn't be surprised. We could be sad, like, oh, I can't believe they did this or they left or this or that. But we shouldn't be like, oh my gosh, how did these people do that? I, I think we should be like very realistic about it. Like, yeah, it's very possible. If I look in the past too, very possible. A lot of big leaders left and stuff. A lot of people, leaders got corrupted. A lot of leaders, you know, were corrupted by money or power, whatever it was. And we've seen it all the time. Some have repented and come back and some have not, right? And that's why like even through my life, there was some of these big figures in Korea that were great preachers. And then all of a sudden you find out money became a big issue. All of a sudden you find out that, you know, opposite sex became a big issue and stuff like that too. And, uh, I will not judge them because like I, uh, I talked about this last week is no one really, when you become very big, no one really knows the temptation of what a big person goes through compared to someone at a regular level, right? No one knows unless you've been there, right? The only person that would really know and has made it is something, right? So that's something that we have to look at and say, you know, we got to think about this more clearly. And yeah, it's very possible. I'm sad because it's people that I know. I'm sad because it's people that I'm friends with. But we shouldn't be like, oh my gosh, they did so many good things. Like, no, I think we really, really need to. Because I think we look at the opposite. What about people who we look at don't have the right actions or don't, you know, they're not doing all the things that these other people are doing, but they stay in Providence, right? We would be not as surprised about those people. We'd be like, oh, I'm not surprised they left kind of thing, right? Because we're kind of judging by what we see, where in reality, we shouldn't be judging in that way. Either way. So that's question number one. Uh, and I hope it's something that helps you guys out to kind of uh, process uh, how people can leave even though they had really, really good faith in the past. Second question I think is a very, very good one, right? Because it's more practical about what's happening right now in this time of chaos is what should I do if my family or friends are asking me if I'm in Providence or what, what church I'm in, whatever it is, right? And, you know, if we look at the very, very basic uh 
there's only two basic ways you can answer. Number one is tell them everything or tell them nothing. It's one of the two, right? If you look at, if you break it down to the, to the bare essentials, tell them everything or tell them nothing. And technically, like one thing that you need to realize is um, people have no right to force you to tell them anything. And you don't have to tell anyone anything ever. It's, that's, this is your life. You don't have to tell people what you're doing in your life. You don't have to, right? You know, that, that's kind of like the bare essential to think about is no one can force you and you don't have to say anything to people. That's reality, okay? So now that we have that in mind, let's get into the next step is um, the two options is tell them, tell them or don't tell them, right? And of course, a lot of it also will depend on how old you are and the culture you're living in too. Right, So I would have to say that young people have to be even more careful because they have parents over them that control money and food and shelter and they, you know, they're responsible for you. So their reactions are going to be a lot different. Older people like me have already passed their 40s. I'm not as careful. It's my life. No one's, not, my parents can't tell me what to do. I'm over 40. Right? They can't say anything about what I believe and what I do. They got no control of my life. The only thing they control right now is my breakfast of vegetables, what type of vegetables go in my breakfast and stuff like that. That's it. There's no control, right? So that's why age and culture does play a difference in, you know, how, what you have to really think about also. So let's get into the first option is, um, uh, first option you can do about family and friends is tell them everything. Just tell them, right? This is your choice. This is purely your choice, right? Whichever side you take, it's your choice. If you want to do this or not, it's really up to you. Just realize what you're getting yourself into. Right? You no, know, don't just say things without understanding. Like, oh, I'm just going to tell them everything, right? But you have to understand the consequences of your actions, right? You have to think about it. You can't just say that I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. No, think about everything, right? Because the moment you open it up, then there's going to be constant talking about it. You're going to have to defend yourself. People might come against you, persecute you, try to stop you. You could lose friendships. You could lose connections. And this is just the reality that when you're dealing with human beings, that's what people are capable of doing, right? But if you understand all these things, go into it with confidence. Like, yeah, I understand what's going to go on, right? Like I said, if you're younger, you may not, be up, you might not, may not want to deal with all this. But when you're older, it's not a big deal. Right? And if you're confident about this and have no issues with it and you're okay with it, go ahead. Purely up to you. Now, the second one is a little bit more tricky because this is the one that a lot of people want to do, but they're really like apprehensive and they're not sure if it's, you know, if God will be happy with them or whatever it is, right? So, you know, the same thing is look at your consequences and your actions, right? Because, you know, when you, you, you decide to tell them nothing about it, Right, and then you have to be super careful about your actions, what you leave around, making sure about your social media, uh, you know, not dropping hints or leaving books or leaving your computer on with the message running. Or you know, there's a lot of things that need to be thought about too, right? Like for instance, some people if they're not going to say anything, but you know, you're going to have your your um, your Instagram handle as like, uh, love the Lord one nine seven eight one one seven eight, like that kind of stuff. Like you know, you. <laughs> you're kind of leading yourself up to being discovered eventually, right? Like if you do it like that, like I've seen people in the past, they'll have like pictures like on their phone of like say Sunseam or Sunseam, you know, or someone else or like geez, whatever it is. And, and people notice it like, whoa, who's that kind of thing, right? People put pictures all over their house. And that's something that you look at and you're like, hey, purely up to you. But you know, if you're going to be someone that's not going to tell people anything, you got to, you got to understand that that's the direction you're heading and being very super careful about your actions, what you leave around. You can't just be like, Oh, this is me. Oh my gosh. You know, like you can't do that. Right. If you're, if you're going to take this route, but I think that the biggest thing that people are going to have to overcome in their heads about not telling your friends and family, right. Is about the feeling you might have in your heart that am I lying? am I lying? Is this a sin? What's God going to think? Am I being ashamed of my faith? Like these are things that you're going to deal with inside your heart. And this is probably the biggest hurdle in this option. Like people don't, I don't want to lie. I don't want to lie. Right? So, you know, let me just, let, let's go deeper. Let's unpack this. Like why we're going through this and why sometimes you need to think a little bit more deeply about it. Right? So for me is like, people are going to start saying to me like, Pastor Scott, aren't you just trying to justify lying? But I want you to think about it deeply really, really deeply, that are there times when it's justified in life where you don't tell the truth and everyone's okay with it? 
Are there times like that? And the answer is absolutely. So let me give you an analogy of parents and children. Four-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, whatever it is, comes to you, asks you about how to make babies. Would the parents be like, well, men have penises and girls have vaginas. And what happens is like, would the parents be doing that? Or are the parents a little bit more cautious about it? And then they'd be like, hmm, is this child ready? Are they mature enough to hear this? Would this be something that would actually hurt them? Am I opening their eyes too early? Right? And what would happen is, as a parent, it's their choice as the guardian to make, uh, you know, to figure out what's the best thing to say. Right? Now, let's put it this way. Imagine your kid, you're at your friend's house. The kid comes, asks about sex, you know, how to make babies. And then the parent starts teaching them like other stuff, but doesn't tell them the truth about like, you know, like the female and the male organ and, and sex and stuff like that. Would you turn to that parent and say like, oh, how dare you lie to your children? Or would that parent be like, oh man, that was close. Good job, man. I wouldn't know what to say to my kids. And what happens is most, most like almost, I would say like 99% of the parents are going to be like, yeah, you shouldn't tell a six-year-old about that, right? And they'd be like, good job. I'm going to use that the next time my children ask, right? It's true. And we're okay with it, aren't we? Even though we're not telling them the truth, everyone watching understands the situation, circumstance, and we are okay with it. We are absolutely okay with it right? Because we know they're children. They're not ready for it. Second thing is, another analogy I would give you is uh, when we're okay with lying or not telling the full truth is what about people doing missionary work in countries like North Korea or China, which are completely against like missionaries going in there evangelizing, right? Would you get mad at a Christian missionary who doesn't tell the truth that they're there to actually evangelize people and bring them to the kingdom of God at the bo to the border agent? Would people get mad or would you be like, wow, you got in. Good job. Now it's time to preach the gospel. Right? They're not going to say, you liar. You say you're a missionary, but you lied at the border. How dare you lie to the Chinese officials or the North Korean officials while going there to teach English, but instead you're covering as a missionary. No. They'd be okay with it. You see? So when you look at in life, there are times where... Certain, like not telling the truth is where we accept it as something of situational and circ circumstantial, right? So what is the main point of these two examples I give? Well, when you look at the parent and child, it's about protection. You're protecting them because they're not mature yet. You're protecting them because they're not ready to hear it yet, right? And we are okay with that. The second situation with like say North Korea and China is if you say something, it's going to lead to uh, damage, like violence, death, or, you know, some type of damage to your life. You know what I mean? And we're all going to understand that there is a greater good. There's a greater will. And if this, you know, if you tell the tr the full truth about this, right, it can lead to violence, death, or, you know, other problems happening there instead, or people not receiving the kingdom of God kind of thing, right? So, if you understand these two situations and you and you accept it, so it, I take it that you're going to accept that it's okay in these two situations to not tell the full truth, right? So if we understand these two situations in which we are okay with not telling the truth, we need to apply that to certain situations that are similar, right? So how does it apply to friends and family? Well, if you look at the physical analogy, there is a parent who is mature and a child who is immature, right? They're not ready, where they, you know, and the parents will ch protect the child. And we're talking purely mentally mature. However, now that we're talking about faith, we're talking about faith instead, we're talking about spiritual maturity, which means that even though your parents or your friends who are like, say I'm in my 40s, my friends are in their 40s too, and my parents are in their 70s, right? So one of the mistakes we'll make is, oh, they're 70, they're 40, so they're going to be spiritually mature, which is incorrect. In some cases, it's going to be you are the spiritual parent in, in the position of a spiritual parent because you're mature in spirit and your friends and family may not be. They may be like children in spiritual maturity, right? And just like the parent will not tell the child everything about sex is because they're not ready to hear it or you're there to protect them. It's the same with spiritual maturity, right? The spiritual maturity is if I tell them too much, you know, then they may never come to faith. They may never come to this history.
right? Where I'm here to protect them. They're not spiritually mature. They can't handle all the things that I'm saying, right? And, you know, that you have to look at it from that sense. You need to pray, be wise, look at each person that you can handle. And it's, it's, it's more, that situation comes more of protection because of maturity, not physical, not mental, but spiritual, which is completely different, right? And when you look at the North Korean China example, uh, what's going to happen is, you know, the lack of knowledge, you know, or the, the way that their perceptions are, they are going to misunderstand right away and it can end up in a lot of damage being done to you or to the family or whatever it is, right? And this is more about understanding who you are talking to. If you're talking to an atheist family member, if you're talking to someone who's super zealous Christian or whatever it is, we got to understand who we're talking to, Right? And we need to understand, just like the situation with the missionary going to North Korean South and North Korean China, uh, they do certain things to these missionaries, like torture and death or whatever it is. And you have to look at look at it from that perspective of friends and family who who are going to misunderstand, too zealous, or they're you know they're going to hurt you instead, right? And it's going to hurt other people's chances of coming to this history also. And, you know, that's all about us understanding the people we talk to, how far they will go to stop you. And that's something that requires prayer, understanding uh, of your fam friends and family, right? This is something that's quite normal in society today, too, is we don't tell everyone everything because some people aren't ready to handle it, right? For instance, I just saw um, uh, a post on, um, no, I was watching a series on Netflix, and it's about uh, someone cheated on their husband, right? Someone cheated on their husband. However, the husband at that moment was grieving for their father's death, which means, is it the right time to tell the husband about the affair? And the answer is, no way. People are going to be like, it's not the time. And if, even if they ask you, wait, is something going on with my wife? No, don't worry about it. It's time to grieve for your father, whatever it is, right? And that's the right thing to do, right? Or it could be too, too much for them and they end up hurting themselves or whatever it is, right? So the last thing I, I, I do think that we have to get into our minds is, but now that we're talking about faith, if I don't tell everyone who I am, is that me being ashamed of the gospel? And the answer is, uh, well, yes and no, right? Because are you really ashamed of it or are you really there to protect? That's Those are two different things. If you're just there because you're ashamed, that's different. Oh, I don't want to tell people because I don't want, I'm, I'm ashamed, you know, that what they're going to think about me. No, 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 no. If, if the, There's a difference between being ashamed and protecting and understanding the full situation, right? And, you know, just because you say no and you, 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 you don't tell people you're in Providence, whatever it is, uh, is it, are you... Does that mean you're ashamed? But let's take a look at a real situation even in Christianity. In the early Christian church, uh, early Christian church, they had to hide their faith from the Roman Empire or they would die because they were being persecuted. Would you consider them being ashamed of the gospel or they are wise about under, understanding the situation and circumstance? Two different things. Two completely different things, right? And that's why, you know, when it comes to those two options of tell everything, say say everything and say nothing, the problem, you know, the problem with the say nothing is a lot of people want to use the say nothing, but their guilt in their heart, or they don't fully comprehend or understand that it's okay in certain situations and circumstances, right? And that's why if people don't process that, they're going to always tell the truth or not tell the truth, but always say everything when they don't need to just because of that guilt they have in their heart when they don't need to feel it or not. And I think that's something that people need to process really well or else they're going to get themselves into really bad situations all the time. All right. Either way, so there it is, guys. That is uh, the end of uh, question and answer. Hope it's uh, two answers that really helped you guys out to process your thoughts and certain things, especially what's happening today in today's situation and circumstance. And I hope it's something that uh, you guys will gain a lot from and be able to process and uh, make the right decisions in your life. Okay? So there it is, guys. That is Q&A Thursday for today. So let's move into today's uh, second break. <laughs> Thank you. 
Through all the wind and the trials, still we never did break It really wasn't very easy to put trust in that state So even though our castles in the sand tumbled down But all our tears dream down together to cement the foundation The tears would rock continuously every single day And I wouldn't hold it back because I got through so much pain Now I stand and shake the dust off as I cling onto your Lord is right before me Oh Lord, you'll always be the only answer I don't sit here wishing happiness will come round I don't sit and wait for it to walk through my door Happiness comes to those who take action on love When I love with perfect faith Yeah, perfect faith Happiness will fill my heart When I'm your face with the robot, I think what would you do? Even so, with all that thinking, I fall further in distress and agony. When I lose those thoughts behind, it's a better life. I leave my suffering and failures far behind me. You saw me struggle to chase a brighter future. But running after happiness, I turn to you, our eyes connecting. As you switch your flash, you're smiling, this is what you tell me. Let's create our own happiness, though times it may be difficult. I don't sit here wishing happiness will come Days were once so painful and distressing The massive waves that tore me down were scary and depressing But though confusion, chaos, fear devoured me completely The moment that I found you, I was spared out of the deep sea Now all those moments in my life, no matter how I struggled Are precious and important cause they led me to our meeting So now I'll never leave, you know my faith and love will not go cold And just as you have done for me, I will believe, I will love you more As long as I live, I pray only to the So let's get into our final segment for today on this Thursday podcast. I hope you guys are really enjoying it so far. And of course, this is the time that I am able to uh, go into a kind of a short sermon. So we'll get into sermons in the sky. So one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is about one of the most powerful lessons that we have learned uh, through like the Bible studies, right? Through the 30 lessons. And it's one, you know, when I think about the 30 lessons, there are so many powerful concepts and principles in there. And it's usually when we forget them is when we actually start to lose hope and we start to kind of go down in our faith. And one of the lessons I really want to talk about today is the last days. When you think about the last days, it is such a powerful concept that nothing ends. The last days is the end of that time, but it's the beginning of something better. And it's inspiring to hear that, but it's something that always slips our mind as we live in this physical world. And when we become physical, we always look for an end. We look for the ending of something. 
And we can't help it because in this physical world, it is finite. And many things end, like our clothes, our shoes, food spoils, even housing. You know, even housing ends. You can't live in those places anymore. But even then, we look at our own lives. Everything ends in this world. And it scares us. And a lot of people in this world are thinking, what happens next? Do I just end? What's the point? But when we come to faith, we realize one of the most powerful lessons, which is it never ends. It continues in a different form in spirit. Whether we go to heaven or hell, it continues. Which brings us into our life of faith and those times when we feel hopeless, those times we feel tired and we're going through just way too much. And these questions start coming into our mind. Are we going to do pre-dawn for the rest of our lives? When's it going to end? <laughs> when will the persecution, when will people stop coming against us? When will this trial end? When will all the suffering in life end? And when we become physical, we start to look at these finite thoughts and we get discouraged and we lose hope and we think, when's it going to end? But here we are. We've come to faith. We've come to this new history. And we realize that things never end, especially faith. This faith that we have, it is ongoing. And it's weird because one of the things is, as human beings, one of the things we've always wanted is living forever. How can I live longer? Just a little bit longer. We're always thinking about living forever. And it's almost like we never want to die. But when we realize that we will never die and we will live forever in spirit, what happens? We're happy in the beginning, but when times get difficult, we revert back to our own physical thoughts and wonder, when will it end? Remember the words you've heard. This life on earth is going to end, and all the suffering and pain that comes with this world will end. But for every end, there is a new beginning. There is a new level. There is a new feeling, new thoughts, new realizations. But the greatest of all these things is we will reach a new level of love. Why do we lose hope? It's because we become physical and we forget the things we learned and we think there should be an end. We think, I don't want to go on anymore. Why am I still going through this? And it reminds me of the story of Elijah and the Ravens. And we all know this story. You know, the one thing that really bothered me when I first listened to that story was, Elijah did nothing wrong. He just did exactly what God wanted. He went to Ahab and Jezebel, rebuked them, told them that they were wrong. He did exactly what God wanted. But the thing that I found that was so unfair is that the moment Ahab and Jezebel like, we're going to kill you. Why didn't God jump in? Why didn't God just say, don't worry, Elijah, let me show you. I'm going to show them my power through you so that Ahab would change, so that Jezebel would realize this, like I am the real God. But instead, it's like God didn't stand up for Elijah and just told him to run and hide. Think about it, he was told to run and hide. Kind of feels like today, doesn't it? 
God sent Sun Tzu. God has sent us. And then when it gets tough and there's a trial, this is the second trial, guys. We haven't done anything wrong. And in this difficulty, we think to ourselves, what, 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 God, aren't you supposed to support us? Aren't you supposed to show them the power of this history? Just show them power through sunscreen. Make people go blind or something. Give them all diseases. But instead, we kind of look at it and we feel like God isn't doing anything. But when you think about Elijah's story, why did he run? Why did God tell him to hide? Why didn't God just like tear down the enemies? Take them all out? Why was he told to run and hide instead of fight against this wicked king? And when you really think about it, you have to understand what was the purpose of sending Elijah in the first place. It wasn't to kill people. It wasn't to judge people. It wasn't to send people to hell. It was to save. And sometimes when we get too physical, we lose the whole purpose of this history. I know some people come to church and they wonder why their businesses aren't doing well. They wonder why their children aren't listening. And they're, they're, there's so many things. Oh, aren't we supposed to be blessed by God? But we realize, wait, why are we here? Why do we believe in this history? We didn't come because we thought we we're going to get blessed and riches and fame and fortune. We didn't, we didn't come for any of those things. Think about when you first came to this history. It was not about those things. We weren't thinking that, oh, if I come to church now, then all my businesses will do well. But for some reason, it changed to that, where my health should be better, where my money should be better, my relationship should be better. God didn't send Elijah to judge Ahab. He sent him to save him. And this is why Elijah suffered for three and a half years. Because he realized the Shimjung of God. I'm not here to judge them. I'm not here to kill them. I'm not here to send them to the depths of hell. I came here to save. And the only way this is going to happen and we can understand this is when we finally realize the deep love of God. You see, when a parent and a child are fighting, there's a teenage child and they're just fighting and arguing and arguing. There comes a point when the parent stops and they say, I am wrong. Even though they're not. But why would the parent do that? Why would the parent give up and just make their child seem like they're right? It's because they love their child. They see what's happening. That if this argument goes too far, the relationship will be ruined. They're not there to be right. They're there to have a relationship with their child. And they know that if they change their purpose into being right, they can lose the relationship with the child. Why do we struggle? Why do we suffer on behalf of the wicked? Because the point isn't to judge them. The point is to save. And when we realize about this, this deep love of God, everything starts to make sense. How God keeps forgiving. How God keeps trying to get His people to come back to Him, even though a thousand, ten thousand times they've gone against Him. And in our hearts, we're like, why don't you just judge them again? Why do you have to put yourself through so much pain? It's to save them. And why does God save? Because He loves them so much. 
to the point he would die if they were not saved. And we can see that this is true, that he sent Jesus to die. It was the symbol, the sign that he would rather die than see everyone else die. He would rather go through all the pain, just like a parent looks at their, their like child suffering from cancer and all the parent thinks about is, I wish I could take the pain instead so that the child can be saved. We are not sent into the world to be the judge of all mankind. We are sent to be the conduits of love where people will feel God's love through our actions and our words. That they never feel judged by us, but they can only feel love. That in the end of their life of sin, in the end of the things that they do bad, they'll look back and say, wow, even though I did all these things, this person never stopped loving me. Where does it come from? And they realize it was God. We're going to suffer. We're going to go through pain and suffering. We're going to go through injustices. But it's not for no reason. Our hearts must come back to God and realize the purpose once again. We were, as Jesus said, I was not here to judge, but I came to save. And I hope that all of us too will realize, yeah, that's what we're doing. And this is why it's such a great condition. I hope that everyone will truly be blessed on this Thursday podcast. Have an amazing and awesome day. And uh, I hope you guys uh, will see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. The morning star drive 117.8. You saw me up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly, so let's realign. Just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone.